Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maciej Dąbkowski and I represent Team Poland. I'm proud to show you our solution to problem number 12, Wilberforce Pendulum. A Wilberforce Pendulum consists of a mass hanging from a vertically oriented helical spring. The mass can both move up and down on the spring and rotate about the vertical axis. In this problem, we had to investigate the behavior of such a pendulum and how it depends on relevant parameters. A Wilberforce Pendulum is built from a helical spring that is attached to the ceiling. At the end of the helical spring, there is a mass with controlled moment of inertia. On the phenomenon presentation, you can see how the Wilberforce pendulum moves up and down and rotates at the same time. Because of that, we can say that there are two degrees of freedom, vertical one shown on the left and rotational one shown on the right. Moreover, if you act with a vertical force on a helical spring, it doesn't only elongate, but also rotates, leading to the conclusion that degrees of freedom in our system are coupled. In order to analyze the behavior of Wilberforce pendulum, we need to analyze helical spring first. Helical spring is in mechanical equilibrium when both the net force and the net torque are equal to zero. If we assume that the wire from which the helical spring is made from has a constant cross section and is thin, we can use linear elasticity theory to describe the potential energy of the helical spring. Here on this equation, you can see that it depends on elongation of the spring, rotation of the spring, and five parameters of a helical spring. Three of these parameters depend on geometry of the helical spring. Using the fact that helical spring forms a helix, we can calculate the length of the wire, the curvature of helix, and free torsion, knowing only radius of helix pitch and spring twist, which can be easily measured. The other two parameters of a helical spring are related to its materials. In order to determine them, we need to make separate experiments. In the first, of, in the first experiment, we hang different weights on a helical spring and measured its elongation. As you can see on the graph, spring's elongation depends in a nonlinear way on the force applied to the spring. In the second experiment, we also applied force to the spring, but this time uh, we measured spring rotation. Knowing the spring rotation and elongation when force is applied, we are able to find the values of A and B parameters that describe the spring. Knowing all parameters of all five parameters of a spring, we could calculate the potential energy of a spring at any position, so at any spring rotation and spring elongation. Because of the fact that this potential energy cannot be separated, the coupling in our system occurs. After examining the helical spring, we can now move to system dynamics. The first thing we did was recording oscillations of Wilberforce pendulum in both coordinates. On this 40 seconds long sample, you can see that amplitude of oscillations didn't decay much in time. So the damping in our system is low. Thanks to that, we can use Lagrange function, which is the difference between kinetic and potential energy, to get the equations of motion. These equations of motion are nonlinear coupled differential equations. To solve them analytically, we have to simplify them by making a linearization. We did that by Taylor expansion around the equilibrium position. We got linearized equations of motion, which can be written in a matrix form with three coefficients, linear spring constant, torsional spring constant, and coupling term. It is worth mentioning that all of these three coefficients can be calculated right now because they depend on parameters of a helical spring that had been uh, measured in experiments. Solving the linear equations of motion leads to solution with two normal modes. We can visualize and plot this normal mode. The first normal mode represents oscillations in phase. When, when elongation increases, the rotation increases as well. While the second normal mode represents antiphase oscillations where when the elongation increases, the rotation decreases. You can clearly see this on the simulation of the pure first and pure second mode. The superposition of these two modes creates a general solution. An interesting phenomenon of beating occurs when two normal modes have values close to each other. Then the amplitude of oscillations in one coordinate decreases while the amplitude of oscillation in the second coordinate increases and the situation reverses after some time, as you can see on the graph and the simulation. The theory allowed us to plot some exemplary solutions. 
Here you can see that Wilberforce pendulum can oscillate in many different ways depending on relevant parameters. But in order to compare this theory to experiments, we need to build an experimental setup. Our experimental setup consists of a helical spring and the oscillator that was attached to it. Oscillator had movable ways which we could move towards the center in order to reduce the moment of inertia without changing the mass of the pendulum. There are also some well visible points which we used for tracking. Under the pendulum was a mirror, thanks to which we could record the oscillations with a camera in both coordinates at the same time. But to get reliable data, we also need a procedure to release the, the pendulum. First, we release the pendulum by hand. However, on the long exposure photo taken from below, you can see that it oscillated also in horizontal plane and wasn't stable. So we decided to change the releasing method by burning a thread. This way, we got stable pendulum. We analyzed the motion of a pendulum in tracker software in both coordinates at the same time. Then we were able to compare our theory with experiments, but they didn't match. So we decided to go back to our assumptions and check what's wrong. We found out that they don't match because the spring effect on oscillations can't be omitted. Spring has its mass and moment of inertia, and we have to include this mass and moment of inertia in our system. So assuming the spring is homogeneous and stretched in a homogeneous way, we can include the effect of spring on the motion uh, by adding one third of mass of the spring and one third of the mass uh, of the moment of inertia of the spring to our system. After adding these parameters, our theory agrees with experimental data very well. We can see it comparing the trajectories for different initial conditions. However, comparing trajectories isn't the best way to check if our theory really predicts experiments. So we decided to make a Fourier transform and compare angular frequencies and amplitudes. Here you can see that there are two main fre angular frequencies, which are our normal modes of vibrations. In order to further compare theory to experiments and see which parameters are crucial in this problem, we changed the mass of the pendulum the moment of inertia of the pendulum, and we used also three different springs. In the first experiment, we looked how the reciprocal of moment of inertia, how square of eigenfrequencies depends on the reciprocal of the moment of inertia for three different masses of the pendulum. As you can see, when we increase the mass and the moment or moment of inertia of the pendulum, the value of eigenfrequencies decreases. In the second experiment, we compared the eigenfrequencies to reciprocal moment of inertia for three different spring, springs with different spring constants. And for all of them, our theory matched the experiments. So, but going back to a Fourier transform, we can notice that there are some extra angular frequencies with small amplitude that are that occurred in the experiment but aren't predicted by our theory. To investigate this interesting fact, we decided to go back to our Lagrange equation and solve the full equations of motion, the nonlinear ones. We, we did it numerically using Wolfram Mathematica software. Here you can see comparison between linearized theory, full nonlinear theory, and experiments. Based on trajectories, we can't really say if nonlinear theory is better than linear theory. But if we look at the Fourier transform, we can see that nonlinear theory predicts the nonlinear behavior of Wilberforce pendulum. However, due to the small amplitude of this angular frequency, the linear theory uh, still predicts uh, experiments very well for uh, smaller initial conditions. To summarize, we discussed how the Wilberforce pendulum is built and how important the helical spring in the system is. We determined all five parameters which describe the helical spring using separate, in separate experiments. Then we were able to calculate the potential energy of a helical spring at any location. So for any elongation and any rotation of the spring. We did an experimental setup, which consisted of an oscillator with movable weights, which we used to change the moment of inertia without changing the mass of the pendulum, and a, a mirror, which we used to track both uh, coordinates at the same time, oscillations in both coordinates at the same time. We compared our theory to the experiments 
and found out that spring uh, mass and moment of inertia can't be neglected. The spring also oscillates, so it has to be added to the system. We did that, and our theory agreed with experimental data very well for different initial conditions, different mass of the pendulum, different moments of inertia, and <clears throat> different springs. In conclusion, helical spring construction makes it change its twist when it's being elongated. Coupling between elongation and twist of a helical spring is nonlinear. However, linear approximation is appropriate for small amplitudes of oscillations. Spring mass and moment of inertia are not negligible. They have to be added to the theory. Two modes of vibrations can be distinguished, vertical and angular ones. When natural frequencies are similar, beating occurs. This is my bibliography. Thank you for your attention.